Good morning. Welcome to Equipping Hour. Good to see you here this morning. We're going to take a few weeks and discuss the whole issue of speaking for God. What does it mean to speak for God? Uh, Should we be doing that? And how so? So let me open us in a word of prayer and we'll dig in. Heavenly Father, this morning it is good to gather with your people. It is good to come to you in prayer and express our dependence upon you, uh, how much we need you. As I think about speaking about speaking for you, I fear that I would misspeak. I fear that I would misrepresent you. So help your servant to be clear, to have your heart, to uh, say what should be said. Uh, most of all, God, we, we know that we have nothing authoritative or powerful to say apart from what is your word. So we ask for help to say what you have said and to do so uh, with clarity in a way that helps uh, your people. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be taking a few weeks to talk about false prophecy mysticism, direct revelation. In other words, some of the ways that people claim to speak for God. We know that God has spoken. We know that God has spoken without words in the proclamation of nature. We know that God has spoken clearly in special revelation with words when he descended on the mountain at Sinai and spoke audibly before the people or when he appeared in the word of God, the person of Jesus Christ on the earth. When Jesus spoke, he spoke the words of God, being God in the flesh. And we know that God has spoken in his written word, the Bible. Does God speak outside of his word today? It's an important question. It certainly is true that God has spoken outside of his written word at various points in history. It's clear that he will do that again in the future. But it's very important for for us to understand how God has spoken, where God has spoken. And I'm going to suggest that it's a terrifying thing to speak for God. There are, of course, false prophets. There are those who claim direct revelation. There are those who claim to speak for God in a special revelation sort of way. There are also the false religions and cults of the world. LDS, the Roman Catholic Church, Islam, uh, various cults with individual cult leaders who have all claimed extra revelation, another book, another testament, something else you have to lean on uh, that is direction and revelation from God. There is the charismatic and Pentecostal movement in the 20th and 21st centuries. There is a a tendency amongst evangelical Christians to lean on impressions or dreams Uh, We're going to deal in this series with Wayne Grudem's definition of modern-day prophecy, where he defines New Testament-era prophets, church-era prophets, as those that can be in error. Now, we're going to talk through his discussion of that. We're going to go farther than merely claims of direct revelation in this series. I want to talk about how we give counsel, how we give advice, how we teach God's Word, and how we listen to God's Word taught. All of these things revolve around the hub of speaking for God. And I would suggest this is very serious business. Speaking for God is serious business with serious consequences, both for hearers and for practitioners. I want to build for us a tension where we are afraid to speak for God and where we have courage to speak for God. Now, that may seem paradoxical, paradoxical, even contradictory, but the reality is we must be absolutely afraid of speaking for God, and yet there are many commands in Scripture for believers in all walks of life, those with official teaching capacities, and all Christians to actually speak for God. So we want to simultaneously build fear and courage. And I think these things can go together. Similarly, we're going to work together to build conviction and humility. 
later in this series, we'll see that conviction and humility are not at odds with each other. Some people think that if you have conviction, you are by definition arrogant. Such is not the case. The one who is humble is the one who trembles at God's word. And if God says, speak, and you speak according to God's word, that is actually a mark of humility. It would be arrogance to disobey God, disregard God's commands, to shudder when God's name, His truth, His word are blasphemed, and to not speak up for Him. Uh, That would be a, a mark of Um, not pride, um, but humility when we actually affirm God's truth. If you think about Paul and the relationship to those Bereans that he visited in Acts 17, they were cross-checking Paul's words with the Old Testament. That's going to indicate for us that if we are to assess our speaking for God or assess others speaking for God, we must actually be students of God's written revelation. It is appropriate for pastors to be cross-checked by Bible readers if it was appropriate for an apostle to be cross-checked by those he targeted with the truth. I think it's going to be helpful for us to think through God's solutions to life's problems. Sometimes we have a tendency as Christians to think, well, I'm a Christian, I love my Bible, therefore what I say is biblical, therefore advice that comes out of my mouth is biblical because I'm a biblical Christian. And sometimes we throw our weight around, even our authority of preferences around, in a way that doesn't match the high bar of God's authority and truth. We have to be careful about that. We have to be careful about our advice, our counsel, our discipleship. And it's important for us to remember to give God's solutions to life's problems. Some of us actually love to be the go-to person with advice for various situations, uh, to be an influencer. To, to, to give input on, on how life should be lived. And if we're not careful, we can invoke the weight of God's name where it does not belong. There's lots of areas of life for freedom and preferences and ideas and opinions. And it's helpful for us to think about as Christians, as ambassadors for God, when it is we are speaking for Him properly versus when we just have our own ideas. We need to carry these things in the right way. And then when we do jump into life's problems with God's solutions, oftentimes it's helpful to adopt God's vocabulary. And it's common in our day to describe adultery with the word affair, or to describe sinful anger with a word like frustration. In other words, to take things out of maybe sin and repentance categories and put them into lifestyle categories or other things. If we're going to speak for God with God's solutions into life's problems, again, we have to go back to the written word of God. And, And sometimes that means a change of vocabulary, even adopting God's ways of saying things for clarity's sake, for true help. It's very possible to misdiagnose situations because we don't know God's heart on a matter. This is where being quick to speak is harmful. If we believe what we're giving is biblical, we don't know the whole story. All of this is just serious business. I want you to turn to James 3. James 3, chapter 1, chapter 1. James chapter 3, verse 1. And what is, I believe, a very haunting verse. This was a verse that jumped out of my Bible when I was a seminary student. And created a bit of a crisis for me in a first year of of studying God's word at the seminary level. The command is this, let not many of you become teachers, my brothers, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. This is serious. To to take on a mantle of teaching, public proclamation, 
uh, formal instruction of God's Word is a high bar, a high standard. It comes with high accountability. And according to James chapter 3, whose context is all about taming the tongue, the high standard is an impossible one for humans. If anyone can tame the tongue, he is a perfect man. See what forests are set ablaze by such a small spark. We understand that when words are many, sin is sure to follow. And so teaching comes with the occupational hazard of throwing around words, potentially setting things ablaze. And lives are at stake in the teaching of God's Word. The consequences of imbibing error, especially when it comes under the banner of truth or the guise of truth or, or whitewashed in the halls of a church, these are serious. It is a dangerous thing to take God's Word on your lips as a teacher. There will be stricter judgment. But turn to Ephesians 4. Here's the tension I want you to feel. There must, of course, be teachers and preachers and proclaimers in the church. There must be elders who are able to teach. But look in Ephesians 4, 15. Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head even Christ. That is, believers are to be speaking truth to one another, God's truth to one another, in love for the building up of the church. So while it is serious business and, and ought not to be tread upon lightly to speak for God, it is actually a mandate of the Christian life. We ought to be those who, in terms of evangelism, in terms of discipleship and care for one another, to a lost and dying world and to the building up of the church, speaking God's truths one to another. We must. So I want us to live in a James 3 and Ephesians 4 tension. I want us to fear speaking for God and in obedience to God, courageously do it. Speaking for God is serious business because there are ways that we can easily misrepresent Him. Misrepresent His truth, mis misrepresent His heart. The goal for us is not to shy away from speaking truth. And, and if the effect of this series causes you to close your mouth, uh, that would be a misapplication. The goal here is to develop in us a right and healthy fear of misspeaking on God's behalf and develop the knowledge and the courage to speak on God's behalf. To be courageous, to say without fear what he has said, but to be afraid to add words, to take things away, to misrepresent him, to make up stuff in his name. We are to be ambassadors of our Redeemer King. He is away. He has commissioned us to speak on his behalf. So you have pastors, teachers, elders who must be able. We do evangelism where we are speaking for God. We will sing the truth one to another in songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. Ephesians 4, we are to speak the truth in love to one another. We must not be paralyzed to speak. We must take care in speaking. We ought to be Bereans and cross-check what we hear that is said to be God's Word, which means we must know God's Word, which will give us a foundation for testing the spirits. This James 3, 1 haunting verse never goes away. I've had to be up front and speak in front of people enough times that my fear of public speaking has gone away, but my fear of preaching never has. It is a terrifying thing. I, I am still afraid of announcements. So doing welcome and announcements on Sunday morning. And I am afraid of like a, a junior high chapel at a Christian school. That's terrifying to me. Um, but for the most part, I'm, I'm over the fear of most venues of public speaking. But I am still afraid of preaching. I have a lot of books on shelves. Uh, in three different places, there are shelves of books 
I haven't read all of those books on all of those shelves. And I think some of those books sit there and think to themselves, oh, maybe he'll pick me up one day. And I have that same hope. Sometimes in some seasons, the books accumulate faster than they can be enjoyed, and the pile grows. But any given book in my collection may hope against hope that when I glance at its spine, it thinks to itself, so he's saying there's a chance. (laughs) One book that stares at me from my shelf of books on preaching, a book I have not read, past the table of contents, has in large letters on its spine the title, Who Dares to Preach? I don't know if that is intended as a rhetorical question (laughs) or is intended to be answered, but that title is haunting. The title speaks to me. I'm not sure I want to read that book. You see, there is an adventure in studying God's Word, and that's a delight. And there is a task of communicating God's Word, and that is a fright. The immense privilege it is to dig into God's Word, God's Word in our own language. God's Word recorded for us, His mind, His thoughts, His ways, eternal realities, truths that explain all of life and the world and history. The God who knows me better than I know myself tells me what I'm all about. There's nothing like the Word of God. No one will ever exhaust it in a lifetime. No amount of study could overturn every stone. No amount of brilliance could accurately unearth every single detail in this magnificent book. It won't grow boring. And there are reasons that we subjectively could become bored with God's Word, but that's the problem with us, not the book. The the great adventure of a lifetime of studying God's Word is a delight. The heavy task of communicating it accurately with God's authority, working hard not to add or take away from His voice, His heart, that's terrifying. This is heavy business with awful accountability. And here's the reality. God's Word is inerrant, and human communicators err. There's never been an infallible sermon. Although the hope is sermonizing carries the authority of God's word, but only as far as it's accurate. Humans fail. God's word is powerful. God's spokesmen on the earth are weak. We can't live live up to what God's word demands, and yet we proclaim those demands before others. When you think about evangelism and you talk about what it means to surrender to Christ and you think, man, is my life surrendered to Christ in all the ways it needs to be? And yet that's what I'm asking this unbeliever to do. We are weak. We praise God for his justifying grace, the kind of grace in the gospel that declares us to be righteous contrary to our performances. We praise God for His sustaining grace, His grace which causes us to walk and to persevere and to grow, His grace which teaches us to deny ungodliness, His grace which will not let us go but brings us into greater conformity with His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, so that there is a pattern in life of greater conformity to God over time. And yet the closer you get to God, the more you are like Christ, the more poignantly you feel your shortcomings, and your weaknesses. Old, godly saints feel their sin more deeply than young ones. If you walk with the Lord a long time, you will consider yourself to be the chief of sinners in greater and greater measure, even while your outwardly observable sinning is on the decline. You just feel it more. We feel our weakness. We need God's grace. And we need His grace for the declarations from God's Word, those things we are to proclaim to the world. 
And without God's grace, without justifying grace and sustaining grace, and without the commands of God to actually go forth and say his words, who would dare? Who would dare say, thus saith the Lord, and then spew out his own ideas? Terrifying. What will you do when you meet God face to face? And there is accountability for such things. And listen, all of this weakness in us and all of the strength and power and clarity in the Word of God is all by God's design so that the power of God may be manifest in our weaknesses. And the exercise of all of this is sanctifying. You dive into God's Word. You you want to be of help to someone who is asking, what are the answers to this life dilemma? And you go dig into God's Word. And you know God is sovereign and you know he's a good shepherd and you, you give what you can give into this situation from God's word. And you pray that God would use it. What a privilege to be an instrument in his hand to those ends. This is a good thing. And yet it is a humbling thing. In the exercise of it, you realize, I don't have what it takes. I, I, I am not the solution to these problems. But God is. God's word is. If you've ever thanked Tom Engstead for some wise counsel, for some godly input, for some moment of encouragement and a godly arm around your shoulder, what's Tom's response? Praise God and I'm just a beggar helping other beggars find bread. What a great response. There's not self-sufficiency when you come to grips with the real problems of life and the real solutions in God's word. You happen to be an intermediary. You happen to be pointing somebody to this book and say, look what God says. And you watch lives transform because the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to discern inner workings. We can't do that. But God's word is powerful. And his word does that. And so the handling of God's word in any public way, any instructional way, any discipleship way is to be done with humility and holiness. What I mean by that is we come not as the answer man, but as the one pointing to the one who has the answers and has disclosed them. And we do that with a look to our own hearts, our own lives, an eagerness to come under God's word ourselves. It's a dangerous thing to find yourself to be a teacher of God's word and enjoy the teaching of it and not be in subjection to it. Because God's people look to teachers. You may be someone who who is a, a ready dispenser of wise, godly, biblical counsel. And people may be coming to you and say, will you help me with this, that, or the other thing in my life? And if you're not careful in your flesh, you will say, huh, I did have the answers to that. That felt good. (laughs) Don't go there. (laughs) It's not true, and it's very dangerous. It's so critical for us to come to this immense, haunting, daunting task with humility and holiness. Later in the series, we'll discuss the relationship between humility and authority, humility and conviction. True humility is not being silent when untruths are present. True humility is not the weakness of remaining mute when God's character and God's ways are maligned. You can, Christian, and you must be simultaneously humble and courageous. The way to do that is to put your trust fully in the actual words of God. And by that, we also mean their intended meaning. It's not as if the Bible is a book of magic incantations. If I just say the words in the order that they're written on the page, stuff happens. No, you, you actually have to have the meaning, the authorial intent. John MacArthur has famously, famously said, if you do not have the meaning of the scriptures, you do not have the scriptures. The, the bare words are not the power, but God's meaning in those words. 
And so to, to, to do this, to, to trust fully in the actual words of God, God's meaning in those words, means to eschew or put away trust in self. And that's the recipe for conviction and courage in a heart of humility. And such humble courage is useful, though imperfect, in one who would be a spokesman for the Lord. We'll never be perfect this side of eternity, and yet we can be useful in God's providence to speak for Him. Turn to Titus chapter 1. In verse 2, we find out something about God's very character. In the middle of verse 2 of Titus chapter 1, we discover that God cannot lie. And then Paul tells Titus that God promised things long ago. What do we find out about God properly in Titus 1-2? God cannot lie. You say, well, wait a second, I thought God was omnipotent, all-powerful, the almighty, the pantocrator. There is nothing which my God cannot do. Well, yeah, there are things God can't do. Titus 1-2 says he cannot lie. He is incapable of being untrue. And so while generally speaking, we could say God is omnipotent, all-powerful, he can do all things, what we mean by that is God has the power to do all things which are in keeping with His character, His purposes, His plan, His promise. God can't stop being God. God can't make a round square. God can't make seven times seven equal 386. And God cannot lie. This is staggering when we think about God's Word. If God cannot lie, and God has declared that this book, this Bible, is His, 2 Timothy 3.16, breathed out word. This is not men scribbling on a page and God breathing on it in such a way that it sort of makes it special. No, this is God actually communicating His heart, His mind, His purposes via His words through human instrumentation. Peter says that these men were born along by the Holy Spirit. That is, they wrote and composed without error the very words of God. This is God's word. And because God cannot lie, His word cannot lie, His word cannot err, His promises cannot fail, they cannot fall, God will be faithful to Himself. Now you put this inerrant word with 100% accuracy in the mouth of man. And, and we run into some trouble, potentially. If you've ever played telephone game, you know the phenomenon. You get in a circle of 20 or so people and, and you say some sentence and that sentence gets repeated, whispered in the ear of the next and the next and the next and the next. And of course, with 20 people involved, it never comes out the other end the way it started because some people are hard of hearing, some people don't whisper clearly, but then you got that guy. No, you are that guy, you're laughing, who intentionally maligns the sentence I'm going to make this not be what it started. I'm going to make it crazy. I'm going to really embarrass the next guy who has to repeat what I say. And the same is true with the conveyance of God's truth. God's truth is without error. In itself is powerful. And yet when we convey the truth, sometimes we don't read it right. Sometimes we don't speak it correctly. And then there's that guy who sees what God's word says and has a better idea. I'm going to say something else. I'm going to say what I want to say. There was a movie a number of years ago that portrayed the Bible in a really fascinating way, really in three different ways. There was a blind man who was actually devoted to the contents of the Word of God because he had a relationship, ostensibly, this is Hollywood, so forget the details for a moment, 
Um, but he actually personally knew God. And, and that's why the word of God was precious to him. You had a museum keeper in the movie who wanted the word of God as a relic, as an artifact, and put it on the shelf with other ancient books, even other ancient books that, that made a claim towards some sort of divine authenticity. And then you had another character in the book who was a charlatan, a huckster, who knew contents of the word of God and, and held it up over people to control them, to manipulate them, to have power and money. It's a really interesting picture of several approaches to the same book. And again, the book is not the problem, but we cannot trust man with it. And if you or I would speak for God, we must fear God and courageously labor to know God's word well enough to speak it accurately with authority and clarity and conviction and courage. Turn in your Bibles to Psalm 108. I want to take a little rabbit trail on the doctrine of man for a moment. We've been talking about the word of God. We're addressing the, the question of should man speak for God. And let's just think about man a little bit. Psalm 108 verse 12. The psalmist says this or sings this. Oh, give us help against the adversary. For deliverance by man is in vain. Through God we will do valiantly, and it is he who shall tread down our adversaries. That is a, an implicit or, or an explicit contrast between trusting God and trusting man. We see the same contrast if you fast forward to Psalm 118. And the idea of trusting man has as its counterpart fearing man. I can trust God rather than trust man. I can also trust in God rather than being afraid of men. This is the reality in Psalm 118. Look at verse 6. Yahweh is for me, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Look at verse 8. It is better to take refuge in Yahweh than to trust in man. Verse 9. It is better to take refuge in Yahweh than to trust in princes. In other words, not even just common man, but, but the best of men, noble men, privileged men, men with access and power. Don't trust in them. Turn to Psalm 146. And verse 3. Do not trust in princes, in mortal man in whom there is no salvation. Why? Verse 4. His spirit departs. He, retur he returns to the earth. In that very day his thoughts perish. How blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob. You see the contrast. Even in the realm of theology, even the realm of exegesis and, and biblical studies, ideas come and go. And men, with their man ideas, perish. Their very thoughts go with them to the grave. What lasts? The word of the Lord stands forever. There are days and times where some ideas and some views will sweep through evangelicalism. They'll, they'll sweep through the church and they'll take root and they'll take hold. And then they go away, and they're replaced by some other idea. And you realize, oh, that didn't stand the test of time. It didn't hold up to the scrutiny of conformity to God's word. But for a moment there, we all bought the book. We all read it. We all got the bracelets and the calendars and the, I mean, all the merch that goes with it these days. And those things fade. And the wrong ideas that men come up with go to the grave with the men. But you can trust in God's word. I would turn your attention, though not your eyes at this moment, to Isaiah 40 to 48. That would be nine chapters too long to try to read. But I will sum it up this way. There is no one like Yahweh. There's no one like him. Who will you compare to him? 
the, the regional gods of the various nations? Any kings or princes, any man? Listen, even Isaiah was a sinner who needed to have his mouth washed out. But God's word is clean. God's word is pure. It comes from him. He will be trusted. Turn to Isaiah 51, verses 12 and 13. Yahweh says this, I, even I, am he who comforts you. Who are you that you are afraid of man who dies and the son of man who is made like grass, that you have forgotten Yahweh your maker who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth, that you fear continually all day long because of the fury of the oppressor as he makes ready to destroy. That's an interesting contrast. Circumstances have boiled over on the geopolitical scene and are encroaching on the people of Israel. And they're tempted to fear everything but God. But God is bigger and scarier than every oppressor. God is bigger and scarier than every dark circumstance. And to trust in Him is true refuge. Listen, whatever happens in life, whatever the words of men may be, you and I have an anchor in the Word of God that is sure. And it may seem like an onslaught from the world around us. At times, there are onslaughts of theological ideas within the church. None of those are a real threat to the truth. And if you cling to God's words, that is your safety. Let the world go. God's Word is worth trusting. One significant implication of the don't trust man subsermon is the sub subsermon of that subsermon, which is don't trust yourself. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust Yahweh with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He'll make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear Yahweh and turn from evil. Those were verses I memorized as a kid. They were sing-songy. And I kind of forgot what they meant. Until I was older. And I went back and read Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 as if I had never sung it before. As I was compiling a list of who to trust, who not to trust. And there it was. In, in blazing bright letters saying, don't trust Smed. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's not how I learned that song. No, that's what the song said the whole time. You just weren't listening. Listen, there is a serious crime of trusting man over God. And that works itself out in a life of teaching or discipleship or even evangelism, counsel, advice giving, preaching, where we wouldn't be afraid to put our own ideas out there with the label of biblical or couched in terms of this is what God wants for your life. There are very egregious examples of that perhaps in the charismatic movement where someone comes up to you and says, I have a word from the Lord for you, puts their hand on you, and then tells you what God told them to tell you. I've had that happen to me, and I've done that to others. That would be a a, a very egregious, now when I think about it, lightning-inducing, scary thing to contemplate, putting words in God's mouth in in such a, a blatant way. But any ways that we would misrepresent God come with serious consequences, saying, thus saith the Lord, when the Lord thus not saith. Think back to Exodus 20, you shall not bear false witness. God God takes it as serious business that in the realm of human affairs, in in courtrooms and in testimonials for and against one another, uh, we would not falsify information. 
How much more awful is it to misrepresent God than to misrepresent each other? To bear false testimony about God's words. And and I would suggest to you, I've written down nine. We may come up with more of these before this series is done. But nine ways that this is done. Something of of a survey of misrepresentation of God. Uh, The first one, and we'll look at this briefly this morning, is false prophecy, false prophecy. Uh, The second would be additions to the Bible. People that just come out and say, uh, the Bible is not complete, we're going to add Doctrines and Covenants, the Book of Mormon, Pearl of a Great Price, the Apocrypha, uh, Ex-Cathedra Statements from the Pope, the Roman Catholic Magisterium, we're going to add the Quran, you know, whatever it is, the, the writings of Mary Baker Eddy, any cult leader, uh, any false religious group that adds more revelation to the Bible, all those would fall under the category of the warnings against, do not add to God's word. Oftentimes the cults that do this, the, the David Koresh's, the, the, the cult leader that says, everybody else is wrong, I'm the only guy right, don't bother what you read in your Bible, listen to me. Uh, th- those ones are, are often uh, involved not only in, in stating new ideas from God, but claiming singular allegiance to themselves. And, and so even, even amongst uh, well, amongst cult leaders and even those who might not quite be cult leaders but, but have a high view of their own authority will say things like, don't touch the man of God. And the idea is the mouthpiece is equivalent to the glory behind it and the authority behind it. That's why you cannot address the morality scandals of a charismatic teacher because if he is the voice of God, He can't be spoken against. A third category, we're talking about false prophets and additions to revelation. A third category would be claims of direct revelation. Uh, These can be overt. Um, Here's what God told me yesterday. Uh, They could be uh, more subtle than that, Uh, more subtle than just declaring yourself to be a prophet. (laughs) Um, Some of the more subtle phrases is, uh, you know, God's been impressing upon my heart. God told me this. Uh, We'll we'll talk a little bit more about that. A fourth category would be impressions, dreams, uh, mystical experiences, uh, living by signs, interpreting providence as special revelation. We'll talk about the difference between providence and special revelation. A fifth would be charismatic experiences. We'll we'll deal a little more specifically with the the, the church side of the experiential charismatic movement. Uh, Sixth would be Wayne Grudem's definition of New Testament prophecy. Uh, Seventh, we'll we'll come back to this issue, issue of teaching and preaching. What kind of care must we take leading a Bible study? teaching in NGM. Now, don't get scared yet and drop out of NGM. In fact, we need more servants, teachers, classroom helpers in Next Generation Ministries, our kids' ministry that happens during the main service. Don't quit. Don't turn in your resignation. In fact, go fill out an application and help. (laughs) But there are things for us to think about in terms of the care we need to exercise with our gifting, our ability, our resources in good conscience before the Lord getting his word right. Number eight, offering advice, counsel, even commands to others and being careful about giving the impression that our ideas are biblical or our ideas are God's will when they may not be. And number nine, maybe this falls in one of the other categories, but the I prayed about it version of direct revelation. We just wanna clarify that prayer is vertical from us to God, that's us talking to God. Prayer is not God talking to us. The Bible is God talking to us. We speak to God in prayer. God speaks to us in his word. The, man, I have this really important decision to make. Should I cheat on my taxes? I prayed about it. I feel good. (laughs) It doesn't work that way. Um, So we'll touch on that one too. So uh, let's start with the category of false prophets. And and I want to summarize some of the consequences of, of any of these categories where we speak for God when God hasn't spoken. Uh, One serious consequence is just living by falsehood is not good. 
If you think that God has spoken something he hasn't spoken and you therefore live by it, you live by a lie, you live by that which doesn't have divine warrant, and that creates problems in life. We just don't want to do that. Um, it leads, according to Jeremiah 23, 16, it leads to futility, emptiness. A second real consequence is that real problems tend to go unaddressed when we're not in a steady diet of God's actual words and we replace God's actual words with the fill-in of what we think God must be saying through various other sources. And, and this is a real problem for us. We'll come back to this in Jeremiah 23. There, the problem was that the people despised the Lord and they had stubborn hearts. And yet the prophets in Jeremiah 23 said, oh, you have peace. You have peace, horizontal peace, peace with God. It's all good. Life is good. And it wasn't good. The people sat in hard-hearted rebellion against the Lord, and those who claimed to speak for the Lord said, peace, it's all good. This is modern religions. This is liberal evangelicalism. I'm okay, you're okay, we're all okay, we're all God's children, God loves everybody, blah, blah, blah. That's not a good message. That's not God's message. It has disastrous consequences, eternal ones. Another consequence of false prophecy, those who claim to speak for God but they actually don't, is the discrediting of the truth. You see, when someone says, here's what God says, and then that turns out not to be right. Bad advice, unfulfilled promises. It, it doesn't live up to the God cannot lie thing. And now people have the impression, people that have heard pastors, preachers, prophets, teachers say God spoke and then it didn't come true or it was false or there was a life of hypocrisy or whatever the, the discrediting nature. Then people say, yeah, I heard that God stuff. I'm out of here. I'm not listening to that anymore. How many people do you interact with that you ask them, have you read the Bible? And they say, oh, I know what's in it. Have you ever had that response? I feel like I get that all the time. How do you know what's in it? Have you read it? I don't know. I got a pretty good handle of what the Bible's about. Oh, can you tell me what the Bible's about? Oh, you know, be good, be nice to people, golden rule. Really? <laughs> yeah, try hard. God understands. We're all God's children. God helps those who help themselves. You know, all this stuff just comes out that's not the Bible's message. Where do they get that? Ideas of men parading under the banner of thus saith the Lord. The consequences of this are dire. You think about the Millerite controversy. The Millerites were those who um, ha had taken a futuristic view of unfulfilled prophecy. Okay, we would agree with that. Uh, prophetic promises that have been made but not yet fulfilled. We don't say, nope, God doesn't keep his word. We just say, when, Lord, how long? <laughs> When's that gonna happen? Can't wait to find out. So the Millerites took a futuristic view of unfulfilled biblical prophecy, and then they started setting dates on the return of the Lord. And what happens when they set a date in the 1800s and Jesus didn't come back? I mean, pretty sure he didn't come back. What gets discredited? Well, the Millerites, although some people still believed their message, it was bizarre. Jesus actually said, no one knows the day or the hour. So if you're making dates for the return of Christ, you're already off the map. You're sinning. And yet their message wasn't discredited in-house, but outside people go, oh yeah, the Millerites are bad. I'm still, I'm still glad God will keep his promises. No, a lot of people just said, futuristic views of unfulfilled biblical prophecy is all a bunch of garbage. See the Millerites? And do you understand the phenomenon? The, the truth gets discredited along with the error because those claiming to speak for God take down the truth with them. This is severe consequences. And then a fourth consequence of this is it leads people away from God's word. Here's the human tendency. Anytime there is extra revelation, the extra revelation draws our attention. It tends to become the gravity of attention. 
We always seem to go to the extra biblical revelation. I know when I personally was seeking a word from the Lord internally through mystical revelations and personal experience, through signs. I didn't read my Bible as much. It's a lot easier to let this collect dust on my shelf and to just sit and get something and feel it and feel spiritual about it and then go talk to other people and get spiritual vibes from other people and feel good. And we could have Jesus talk and God talk and impressions and God's leading me this, God's leading me that and God's teaching me. And it feels good and spiritual. It even feels like a personal relationship. And God's actual words that he took care to inscripturate, meaning put them down in writing so they can't be changed and they can't be mistaken. Because he cares about us and he wants these to be an anchor for our soul. Ah, I don't need the anchor. I'll just go adrift with all these impressions and feelings. For me personally, the mystical impressions took a much higher precedence than the written word of God. And if you do evangelism with Mormons, what takes precedence? Mormon doctrine, pearl of a great price, doctrines and covenants, what they learn in seminary. Seminary in the Mormon world is you know, high school Bible study before school and then local neighborhood. That stuff takes precedence. What, what takes precedence in, in Roman Catholic theology? The, the magisterium of revelation apart from the Bible, the whole collection of all of their authorities of how you should live. And by the way, no Catholic can define what all the things are you're supposed to know and believe. It's just this massive amorphous blob of stuff that's outside the Bible. You'll spend a lifetime just trying to figure out what it is, much less obey it. And all the while, the anchor for the soul is right there. And of course, the the cult leader trying to win power and money and influence and slaves and all this stuff for himself has no interest in you actually knowing what God means by what he says. He wants to use words in this book as a weapon to get you to submit to him. The extra revelation always puts the Bible on the shelf because the Bible is normal, passe, boring, bookish, legalistic, when in fact the, the Bible is none of those things. The Bible is power, clarity, authority, life. It is where we meet with God himself. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word and its power. We lament counterfeits that we have looked to, leaned on, even perpetrated. God, we pray that we would be people of the book, that we would be those who are so thoroughly familiar with your words that counterfeits are easy to spot, that unhelpful, untrue thoughts and ideas and worldviews become crystal clear in their shortcomings. But more, more than all of that, God, we want to value your word as that which brings us to you, that we might know you, the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord, the, the, the greatness of having our hearts and thoughts reoriented and recalibrated to spiritual things, eternal things, true things over and against the pressures of sin inside us, the world around us, and Satan, the God of this world, as a mortal enemy. Your word endures. I pray, O oh God, that we would not trust in men whose thoughts perish and go to the grave with them. We would not trust in princes, but that our implicit and complete and total trust would be in your word. And then, O oh God, give us courage to speak it to honor you by it, in Jesus' name, amen.